Amen. You may be seated. Again, good evening, church. Awesome. I cannot encourage you enough, again, for those of you that were getting coffee and other things like that while we made the announcements, to go to the next conference. Uh, It's going to be an awesome time, and so you can sign up online, you can call the office, you can do it at the door. We just really want you guys there. But also, uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, The last couple of weeks, I haven't been up on the pulpit. Uh, Last week, um, I was at the East Coast Pastors Conference, which was extremely awesome after the first day. Uh, So I shared this story on Sunday night, but uh, we flew out of here super early in the morning to go to Denver and then Denver to Philadelphia. Well, when I flew from here to Denver, we got there so early, uh, we decided to get some breakfast. And after I ate the breakfast, we, drove to, uh, we flew to Philadelphia. And as we're flying about an hour before, I start feeling a little sick. I start in my stomach, I can feel like things turning and I'm like, oh no. And there's a little turbulence. And about a half an hour before we land, you could hear the captain come on and go, this is your captain speaking. I'm so glad to, you flew United. Uh, it's a sunny 71-degree uh, day here in Philadelphia, and so uh, we're about 15 minutes ahead of schedule. So I hope you guys all enjoy it and uh, buckle up, and uh, we'll see you in a little bit. And uh, Fem looks over and goes, are you ready? And I go, uh, no, nope. And I have my little bag, my little bag that you get out of the thing. I always wondered why you needed those until then. And I was like, Oh no, oh no. And we hit the ground and I'm like, if I can get off this plane, we're gonna be okay. If I can get off the plane, we're gonna be okay. And of course there's like rows of people in front of me that are either too short or, or, or needed help getting their luggage down. And I'm like, oh, please, please hurry. I have nightmares about this. I can't do anything. And I'm just like stuck there. And the lady that I was sitting next to, she's like looking at me like, <laughs> you know, we're in a whole different world now with COVID and everything. She's like, oh no, I should have worn my mask, you know? And, and uh, so <laughs> finally I get off the plane and I go to the restroom to no avail. I didn't feel any better. And I was just kind of hanging out just in case, you know, something happened. And then, yeah, I know you guys want me to start the sermon like this. I know every single person was wanting the story. Um, and then we end up, <laughs> we end up getting our luggage and instantly I'm like, David, uh, I gotta go to the bathroom like right now. And so I went to the restroom, which are disgusting because they're airport bathrooms. And I am not gonna touch the toilet nor grab the bottom of the toilet. I'm just going to aim the best I can (laughs) and pray for the person that has to clean up after me, which happened. Uh, But hey, about an hour later, I felt fantastic. it was, really, it was really interesting. I went from being very sick. I think some of the medication went on. Maybe the, the, the food didn't agree with me. Maybe the turbulence. I don't know. But an hour later, I was eating a Philly cheesesteak. So a lot of, <laughs> life is good after that point. It's funny because Chris Begno got in the car when he got in the car. Me and Chris together is kind of a scary thing. You'll see in Israel. Uh, but he punched me in the arm. He's like, hey, bro, how's it going? And that was like right after I threw up. So I'm like, not good, not good. And so he's like, oh, you know, and just kind of teased me a little bit. The next day, <laughs> the next day, he goes to the conference. 15 minutes later, he gets an Uber back, home, back to the hotel where he stayed till five o'clock or so in the afternoon. And then uh, he, he was fine the rest of the night. And then David Enos, the next day, started being sick. And Gerald's like, well, I'm glad I brought three of you. I guess between the three of you, I get one healthy one at a time, apparently. <laughs> You know, and, and, and it's so funny. I mean, it, it was so true. It's like, you know, anyone over the age of 60 was doing great while all the young people are like, oh, yeah, I don't feel so good, you know. Uh, but it was an awesome trip. You should see Gerald on those trips, you guys. It's the wildest thing. It's like, he, he exhausts me just looking at him. I'm like, he's walking everywhere. And he started, a, he started CBI, the third Philippine CBI while he was sitting there. I'm like, you didn't come here to even start this. And it's like, oh, by the time we left, we started another one. You know, it's like, goodness, it is so wild what the Lord has been doing through the faithfulness uh, that he has towards Pastor Gerald and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. It is such an amazing thing that Gerald's willing to step out and say, sure, Lord, if that's what you want me to do, I'll do it. And the Lord's like, well, here's another Bible college and here's another building and here's another thing because he's just doing amazing things all over the world and what a blessing it is for us to be a part of it as a church. Amen? Amen. Amen. But before, uh, before, so last week, Blaine did a great job, except he said, hey, nothing's burnt down. And then the next day, yucca's on fire. So 
Didn't appreciate that. And then uh, the week before, Pastor Sandy brought the message, which was awesome. What a blessing it is to have, you know, just uh, whenever I hear Blaine or Riley teach, it's just such an amazing thing because my daughter cannot wait to get into junior high youth group. And uh, just to know that she's hearing that teaching every single week is, is such a blessing to me that she's being raised up by people that know how to teach the word and that love Jesus. And so we have, we have great Great pastors here. So blessed. But before that, we were in the book of Deuteronomy. So let's open up to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 9. Deuteronomy chapter 9. I should be hearing Bibles going, unless you guys already know that we are in Deuteronomy and you've already opened your Bibles. There you go. Now, you're just, now you guys are just overdoing it. You guys are like. All right. I did have a coffee before I was up here. Bear with me. So we are on this, this book of Deuteronomy, the last book of Moses. Moses at this time is passing on the torch to Joshua. God has chosen Joshua to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And Moses spent these last years of his life pouring into this next generation and, and, and bringing things to their remembrance and things that they needed to know, making sure that all of his bases were covered before he went to the Lord. You know, it's interesting interesting, when my father went home to be with the Lord, one of the last things he did was walked up to the window, and he was just looking out aimlessly, and I said, Dad, what are you doing? He's like, I'm just making sure that all the ends are covered, that everything's good. And this is kind of what Moses is doing. He's just making sure that the children of Israel are in a good spot and that everything that he has learned from the Lord, he's passing on to them. The children of Israel, again, are on the edge of this land, ready to inherit that which God has for them. And so far, we've already seen Moses urge them to observe and obey God. The covenant that they are under is the old covenant, which is they are obeying and observing God's commands and they will be blessed. There was an important reminder for them. Remember the word of the Lord and observe it. Remember and do it. Remember, remember, remember. There was an importance to following the word of God, but he also gave them a short history of Israel, telling them about their family, about how they wouldn't go into the land. We're gonna look at that a little bit today and just learning from the past instead of repeating the past. And we're going to be in chapter 9 as he continues to remind the children of Israel of things that we've already read throughout other scriptures, but we're going to take a look at again. So let's go ahead and see chapter 9 of Deuteronomy. Look at me. I have to turn there. Sorry. Here I'm making fun of you guys. Okay. I wasn't making fun of you. I was just, you know. Anyways. <laughs> chapter 9, verse 1. Hero Israel. You are to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourself, cities great and fortified up to the heavens, a people that are great and tall, the descendants of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you've heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore, understand today that the Lord your God, he goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you, so you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said to you. But do not think in your heart after the Lord, God has cast them out before you, saying, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me into the possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of the nations that the Lord is driving them out from before you. It's not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess this land, but because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you that, they may, uh, that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because you're righteous, and because of your righteousness. He's really getting that point across if you haven't caught that part. Then he adds, for you're a stiff-necked people. Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you have come to this place. You've been, a rebelli you've been rebellious against the Lord. In 40 years, they've been a mess. Also in Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath and that the Lord was angry enough with you to have destroyed you. But when I went up to the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant, which the Lord made with you, then I stayed on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. Then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. 
And it came to pass at the end of the 40 days and 40 nights that the Lord gave me two covenants of stone, the tablets of the covenant. Then the Lord said to me, arise and go down uh, quickly from here for your people whom you brought out to Egypt have acted corruptly and have quickly turned aside from the way in which I commanded them that have made themselves a molded image. Therefore, sorry, furthermore, the Lord spoke to me saying, I have seen this people and indeed they are a stiff necked people. Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot their name out from under heaven and I will make of you a nation mightier and greater than they. So I turned and I came down from the mountain and the mountain burned with fire and the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked and behold, you, uh, be, and behold, you had sinned against the Lord your God. You had made for yourselves a molded calf. You turned aside quickly from the way in which the Lord had commanded you. Then I took the two tablets and threw them out of my two hands and broke them before your eyes. And this is kind of an important part that if you're an underlining people, I'd encourage you to underline it. And I fell down before the Lord as at first 40 days and 40 nights, I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin, which you committed in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him for, to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure in which the Lord was angry with you to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me at that time also. And the Lord was very angry with angry, uh, Aaron and, they, and would have destroyed him. So I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful for your word. I am so blessed to be back. Lord, I, I, this is such a blessing and an honor, Lord, to be able to speak to your people, Lord. These are your people. You've brought them here tonight to hear a word. And so, Lord, um, I pray that you would be my strength. Lord, that you would speak to your people. Lord, that you would give them exactly what they need, exactly where they're at in life. Father, would you just be glorified in all that we say and that all that we do? And Lord, would our center of our attention be just directly on you tonight? Lord, we're thankful for books like Deuteronomy, books of remembrance, Lord, things that we need to remember and apply to our lives. Lord, so many people overlook these kind of books, but Lord, it's more quoted in the New Testament than any other book. Jesus said it more than anybody else. And so, Lord, if it's that important to you, Lord, it needs to be that important to us. So, Lord, we just pray that it would settle in our hearts and we could just um, encourage us and comfort us and convict us and exhort us to go forward in your name. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. amen. So tonight, real quick, as we've already read a lot of it, you're going to see that tonight is a very humbling part of Scripture. But here's the truth. It's humbling as we're going to look at a lot of the past of the children of Israel and kind of apply it to our lives. But the encouragement is this. Humility is a good thing. Humbling yourself before the Lord is always the best option. It's much better than being humbled by someone else or humbled by the Lord. Amen? So what we're going to look at tonight, we're going to allow the Lord to do a work in our hearts. So let's see what God has for us as we break down his scripture as, as we are used to doing here on Wednesday nights, verses one through three. Hear, O Israel, you're to cross over the Jordan today and go into dispossessed nations greater and mightier than yourself. There are cities that are greater and fortified up to heaven and people great and tall, the descendants of the Anakim, whom you know and whom you've heard, heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore, understand today, the Lord your God is he who goes over before you and he is a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you so you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord has said to you. So we start off with an encouragement. It's an encouragement and it's an ex exhortation uh, for them to move forward and go over and possess the land in which their family and their ancestors would not go and do. But as they go over there, Moses didn't want there to be any confusion or any surprise of what's going to be there when they show up. 
No, it's actually quite the opposite. He wants to tell them exactly what's going to be there. In fact, he begins to remind them of these these crazy things that are going to be there. One of them being, there's these people called the Anakim. And he begins to remind them, remember those people. They're giants that are in the land. These people are seven to nine feet tall. Those people will be in the land when you arrive. These are the same people that your parents and your grandparents were terrified of, and they refused to take what the Lord had for them. They chose fear over faith. And here we go again. Now we have the next generation. What are you going to do with it? Your family, again, chose fear over faith, and that kept them out of what the Lord had for them. Church, how many times does fear keep us back for what the Lord has for us? I remember in 2020, we continually saw those shirts that said, faith over fear. And I love those shirts, but here's the interesting thing about those shirts. It's one thing to wear those shirts and act like we have that. It's another thing to actually walk in faith over fear. Some of those people wearing those shirts still haven't left their homes. It takes more than just saying you have faith. It's actually exercising your faith and moving forward in what God has in your life. I'm not mocking anyone through 2020 or that they're at home or anything like that. But, my, but the point is this, do you believe that God is in control? Because I believe that God is in control of every breath and he knows my time here and there's nothing that can take me before my time and there's nothing that can keep me here when it's time to go, amen? amen. So they're on the border again. They're right there. And you know what's crazy? That enemy that's there is still there. In fact, I think the only difference between the enemy now and 40 years ago is now the enemy's actually probably stronger and more in number than they've ever been. The enemy has actually grown since the last time. Those enemies are there. Who knows, maybe they even grew taller, but it said that they had fortified cities to the sky. So high that it would just be way up there. Giants. And Moses is telling them, just remember this. As you go into this land, no matter how terrifying it is or whatever waits for you, there is a God who is a consuming fire. Regardless of what you can see, do not let it trick you that it is bigger than the Lord that you serve. Your God, who is a consuming fire, will go in before you. He will destroy you. He will empower you to drive them out, and he will destroy them before you quickly. Is this the faith that we have today as we live in 2022 and the craziness that we live in today? That regardless of what waits for us, we are going to choose what the Lord has said he's going to do as he leads us and guides us. Now, it's interesting, Pastor Bob did a message. He did his question and answer. And someone asked, and it was kind of interesting, right after I taught the book of Acts and I was telling people, miracles still happen today, like over and over and over again. Someone said, why aren't there miracles still happening today like they did in the book of Acts? And I wanted to hear what Bob had to say and Bob answered it beautifully. We very rarely get ourselves into a situation where God needs to act or it's not going to work. All over the world, minus America, it's happening. That doesn't mean that God doesn't happen and doesn't do it today, but all over the world, they're seeing it because they're backed up against the wall and the only way for it to be fixed is for faith in the Lord to come and fix it. He used the the, the story of, you know, we always say, oh yes, we have faith, but we also have the $50 in our back pocket that will buy our way out of the problem. This is what it's saying. If you were ever backed up, If you feel like the mountains are too big for you, if you feel like things are too great for you, just remember who you serve. I was sharing it with CBI because they're all about ready to go into situations that are very uneasy for them. They've, they, they came here, which was easy, uneasy for them. And then they got comfortable. And right when they get comfortable, we send them all out all over the world in different countries, in different states. And they serve the Lord again. And, 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 and it's just so crazy because there's so many things in our life that tell us that, that we can't do it. If you keep your eyes focused on the problems, you're always going to be held back. You have to focus on the Lord. And the Lord said that this very thing was going to be, happen to them. And this is the very point which was going to require those steps of faith to go in and inherit the land, even though there was people already there. 
The future was wide open for the children of Israel, but they had to go forward in faith. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who has come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder to those who diligently seek him. The children of Israel must be a people that learn from their past mistakes and their lack of faith. True wisdom from above, church, comes from open confession and dependence on the Lord, realizing that the situation is too great for you, realizing that you can't do it on your own. When you realize that the on-taking is too big for you and you realize that nothing is too big for God, you are in the perfect spot in your life. Moses knows that the eyes of the people that he has led for years have to be fixed on the Lord. And he reminds them of this. You will see an enemy. You will see things that seem impossible to overcome. Fix your eyes on the Lord, not on the giants in the land. With any blessing I've ever had in life, church, it's come with the fear of the unknown. With any blessing I've had, it's come with the fear of the, the what ifs or the problems or it, it could even be viewed as a lack of resources. And I know plenty of people that have never taken the chance or the step of faith in church. It's crippled them. It's crippled who they are because they're so afraid to do anything. Fear is the enemy of your faith. It's absolutely the enemy of your faith. Four through six says this. So he just encouraged them that you're gonna go in, don't worry about the people that are there. God's gonna do it and he's gonna do it quickly. <laughs> and then instantly he just chimes in. Do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out before you saying it's because of my righteousness that the Lord brought me in to possess this land. But it's because the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out from before you. It's not because of your righteousness or your uprightness of heart that you go in to possess the land but it's because the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you, that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, understand the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you're a stiff-necked people. <laughs> I love that about him. I can picture Moses writing this, like right after he's like, okay, they're gonna go in and get the land but don't you even think this has anything to do with your righteousness as he's led him through this wilderness that they've complained for 40 years and, and done all this crazy stuff. He's just riding and the Lord's like, okay, you can move on. And he's like, you stiff neck people, you know, like he signs it off, you know. God agrees with him later. Yeah, they are stiff neck people. Moses gives them a reminder. When you get to the land and you get comfortable, do not forget the Lord your God. When you get to the land and you get comfortable and you're no longer scared and you're no longer having to depend on the Lord for every single meal you eat and everything you do, do not begin to think, well, this land is here because of somehow I can earn it. Something I have done to deserve this is because we're such good people. It's because of our righteousness. No, the reason they are there is not because they are great. The reason they're going into that land is because the people there are so wicked. And also notice that he says, because I'm so good, because I'm good to the promises of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Church, it's easy for Christians to lose sight of, of where we were when we, give our, when we give our hearts and lives to the Lord. It's easy for us to be in a spot to just kind of forget what we look like when we were trapped in bondage and slavery. We can see people Every day, sometimes within the church even, forget this very thing. That the reason that they are saved was not because they were good or they were the most talented. God didn't look at two people and go, well, this guy here is good at singing and this guy's kind of this. And so I need a worship leader. So let's throw him in. No, God actually usually takes the one that can't sing and ends up making it, allowing him to sing and blows people's minds with it. God's using foolish things. God's not using the things that, that, that people can qualify themselves. But it's easy to think the reason that God chose us is because we're so good. He must really, really like us because we can do a lot of good things for the kingdom. And that's why he chose us. No, he chose us, uh, he chose us because he loves us. It's so rather because God is so good. And I truthfully believe in our lives, church, there needs to be a healthy remembrance of our unworthiness before the Lord in our flesh. 
I believe there needs to be a healthy understanding that we all do not deserve his grace. We do not deserve the gifts that he gives us. Now, I'm not saying sit on the ground and wail and moan for, for, oh, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, but I believe there is a truth in remembering this that you realize that if he can do it for you, then he can do it for anyone in this room. Who are you to say that he can't? Well, have you seen their sin? It's disgusting. (laughs) Where were you when he found you? Well, no one knew about my sin. Where were you when he found you? You know, Moses, he's been on this journey with him for a long time, and he really knows these people. He really knows them. And now he's going to give them specific reasons of who they are, specific scenarios of who they are through the past of really how unworthy they are. If they think that they are going to somehow, bla- oh, it's because I'm a good person. It's because, you know, you no, know, it, it absolutely has nothing to do. In fact, he's like, you're a bunch of stiff-necked people if you want the truth. These people never made it easy for Moses, yet God has been so good and so patient with all of them and they're in the edge of inheriting this land, and he's going to give them all these things in 7 through 12. He begins to give them this reminder. He goes, remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you've come into this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Also in Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath so that the Lord was angry enough with you to have destroyed you, And when I went up to the mountain and I received the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant, which the Lord made with you, then I stayed on that mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, and I neither ate bread nor drank water. Do you understand that that's physically impossible? And I always like Bible Bible critics. They'll be like, let's go ahead and turn, uh, you know, to Deuteronomy 9 uh, 9 here. It says that, (laughs) I don't know if you knew this, uh, he neither ate nor drank for 40 days or 40 nights. Uh, I hate to tell you, I, that's impossible. Everything in the Bible without the Lord is impossible. And you know what? If the Lord wants to sustain someone for 40 days and 40 nights, I believe he can. I have no problem with it. He created everything. Why couldn't it? He's done miracles in my life. Why couldn't he? And so that's what happened. I have no problem with it. Anyways. Continuing on, it says, Then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. I've always kind of wondered that. You know, if they ever found the Ark of the Covenant, what it would look like, God's finger, his handwriting, you know, you'd be like, I knew he wrote in cursive. You know, it's like, in my mind, it's always in cursive. Perfect penmanship. You're just like, Lord, you have great handwriting. Um, you know he does. You don't argue. You know he's got great handwriting. Uh, and all of them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to them on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. Verse 11, and it came to pass at the end of the 40 days and the nights that the Lord gave me the two tablets of the stone, the tablets of the covenant. Then the Lord said to me, and remember there were sounds of music and, and yelling and things like that. Arise, they're probably listening to Katy Perry. Arise, go down quickly from here for your people whom you brought out of Egypt have acted corruptly. Yeah, definitely Katy Perry. And they have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded image. Just in case you have any question on how much of a stiff-necked people you are, I'm going to give you some circumstances for the the rest of the time here. I'm going to give you some more and more reasons and to show you how stiff-necked you are. And the reason he's doing this is not because he wants to beat them down. He wants to continue to show them that God is so good. You have done all these things, and yet you're on the border of receiving everything that the Lord has promised to you. He never took it back from you. He's giving it to you despite who you really are. Church, if God can work with these kind of people, God can work with you. God has already been God and Savior to some of the most difficult and stubborn people that I've ever met in my life. And Jesus loves them. I I, kind of use it as a story like this. I have friends that have a quiver full of children. They're great parents. But quiver full of children. Any, Any people like that in here, quiver full of children? It's great when you go over their house. It's full of life, isn't it? It's always a good time. Within a couple minutes, like there's someone dropping a pizza on the ground. There's, there's hoses being sprayed everywhere. There's the occasional fight. 
Uh, there's an occasional hurt limb where they come in crying. Those, those parents, you can understand whether it's a hurt cry, an angry cry, a whining cry. They know the cry. Like, I'll be like, do you hear that? They're like, that's just the whining cry. Don't worry about it. I'm like, they sound hurt. They come in They're like, she took my toy. And she's like, I told you, it's the whining cry. Go take care of it. And you're like, this is amazing. There's not like, you know, their little fingerprints are just touching glass. They don't care. They don't, they just touch on everything. But it's awesome because I'm able to bring over my family and like, I'm always like, you know, I'm warning people, you know, Vera can be kind of crazy. <laughs> Please, you know, forgive her. And they're like, oh, it's no big deal. We got kids. It's fine. You know, the people that have the most kids are always the best people with house to go over because they do not care what your kids are doing. They're like, oh yeah, no, the house is not burned down. We're doing pretty good. You know, <laughs> things are good. God's the same way with us, church. It doesn't matter how you are today, no matter how much stuff that you need to be delivered out of, no matter how bad you've messed up, no matter how unworthy you feel, God's like, have you seen the kind of people that I save? I'm choosing the people no one else wants to choose. Remember Melvin? I chose that guy. No one wanted him on the dodgeball team and I chose him to be part of my team. This is who God is choosing, church. If you feel unqualified, if you feel like you can't earn it, if you feel like you've messed up too much, you're in the perfect spot. That's where you need to be. That's called surrender. God is ready for you to come to him by faith with all of your problems. And just like my friend allows my kids into his house, God wants to bring you into his house. And Moses begins to remind these children of Israel about really who they are so that they never forget it. He says, 40 years you've been a mess. You've been hard people to deal with. You're a stiff neck. And God's like, calm down again. He's like, okay, we're good. It's like you chose to have more faith in your problems than you chose to have faith in the Lord. Moses then reminds them of the time that he went to go meet with God and get the tablets. He's gonna spend the next part of this chapter talking about it. And he began to talk about in his absence that everyone began to go down and they were at the base of camp and they began to get nervous because Moses was, Moses was gone and they began to worry about him. So they said, hey, we're so terrified. This is in Exodus 32 if you want to look at it. But we're so terrified. Could you please make us, uh, you know, an, an idol to worship? One thing I thought was interesting about that scripture was they waited till Moses was gone. Really, that's when they started to worry is when Moses left. I believe they were in idolatry for a lot of that whole area. I mean, they needed an idol the minute Moses left. I believe that Moses became their idol. Where was their comfort? Where was their safety? The minute it went up onto a mountain, they began to worry. And so they took their idol and they went to some other idol. Moses being absent, they wanted another pacifier in their life because they weren't ready to live on the presence of the Lord. It's another great reminder for us, church. Please don't get this twisted with the way I say this. I don't mean this in any harmful or, you know, rude way. But you cannot get more wrapped up into your pastor or into your leaders than you are into God. At no point should you put your pastor on a pedestal that they themselves will never be able to live up to. They never wanted that position to begin with. At no point should you put your pastor on that pedestal that if something was to happen to him, that you would stop going to church. If you can answer that question, if something was to happen to me, if something was to happen to Pastor Gerald, that you would just stop coming to church, you have an unhealthy relationship with your leaders and pastors. For Israel, God continued to remind them through these scenarios and through these flashbacks. It's about me. I am good to you. It's because I am good. It's not because you're great. It's quite the opposite. You're stiff-necked people, but I still love you and I still favor you. Church, you need to fall in love with that God, that he wants to speak to you, that he wants to move and do a great work in your life. 13 through 22, as we continue on. Furthermore, the Lord spoke to me, saying, I have seen this people, and indeed, they are stiff-necked people. Moses like, told you so. 
Let me alone, that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, that I will make of you a nation mightier and greater than they. And he's like, slow down. So I turned and came down from the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in, the two, in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, you had sinned against the Lord your God. You had made for yourselves a molded calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way in which the Lord had commanded you. That word quickly, I think, is important. Then I took the two tablets and I threw them out of my two hands and I broke them before your eyes, verse 18, and I fell down before the Lord and I want you to know this is the important part. We're gonna look at it. As the first 40 days and 40 nights, I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all, uh, because of all your sin, which you committed in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and the hot displeasure with which the Lord was angry with you to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me at that time also. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron and, uh, and would have destroyed him. So I prayed for Aaron also at that same time. Look at verse 21. Then I took your sin, the calf which you had made, and burned it with fire and crushed it and ground it into very small and uh, ground it very small until it was fine as dust. And I threw its dust into the brook that descended from the mountain. So let's just leave it off right there. But looking at this scripture... Notice that it says Moses was afraid at the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord was angry at them. I, I believe that's a good way to explain what was going on. I mean, it would be a really interesting thing to, to be witnessing as the Lord and how quickly people can get their eyes off of him. But this is the way we, we kind of do things in life today. You know, there's that popular Christian song. It's like, it's a slow fade. I don't know the rest of it, but... It's like, it's like, slow fade. Not all the time. It's, it's also a quick drop, right? For these people, it wasn't a slow fade. It was like, we're on fire for the Lord. It's very quick when you get your eyes off of the Lord. It doesn't take that long to start messing up. Have you ever met someone in your life that they were so on fire for the Lord for a long time? And then you, you didn't see him for a month and you're like, hey, where have you been? They're like, I'm addicted to drugs. I messed up in my life. My wife divorced me. And you're like, what happened? And they're like, I don't know, man. It just kind of started with me not seeking the Lord and things just got crazy. And uh, here I am today trying to, try to get my heart back right with the Lord. It doesn't take long to not realize who you are anymore. The enemy wants you to think that you can just kind of keep going on and slowly going that way. But I think it's quick. I think, I think the minute you start getting your eyes off of the Lord, you're, you're waiting for a crash. You know, we used to, in school, we used to hear about like, you know, drunk driving, you know, not to drink and drive. And um, that's absolutely accurate. But now you hear so much more about like texting and driving because there's a lot of people that are doing it, but everyone knows is if you stop looking at the road for just a few minutes, you could ruin your whole life, right? You stop looking at the road, you continue to drive and you're starting to text, you smack into something or someone or a dog or whatever, and you drive off the road, you can alter your entire life from looking away for a second. Church, getting your eyes off of the Lord can ruin your life for, for the rest of your life. It's not that God can't use you. It's not that God can't redeem it, but it will be a problem for you in your life. It will be a crash getting your eyes off of the Lord. And I think that it's interesting that he says it happened quickly. And so we know that he was angry and he had this anger with the people for doing this, but he was very angry at Aaron, Exodus, 30, uh, Exodus 32. Why was he so angry with Aaron? Because Aaron was the one that was leading them all in Moses' stead. And they begin to get all nervous and they begin to get all worried and they're like, build us an idol. And he's like, okay, uh, give me your earrings and I'll turn it into a calf. What? And then after he made this calf and it came out, he's like, here's your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Can you imagine the Lord going, What? I'm the God that led you out of Israel. That's a piece of gold. Like, what are you doing? And so it says that God was very angry with Aaron. But the reason I think that God was very angry with Aaron is because he was in leadership and in a spot where he should have gently pointed and centered the people back on the Lord and encouraged them in their faith. Be strong. Don't worry about it. 
Moses isn't God. God's talking to Moses. Don't worry about it. It's all okay. Instead, he caved to the pressure of the masses. He shouldn't have caved to the pressure of the masses. Now, God still used Aaron. We know his story. God, Aaron is an awesome hero of the faith. We, we watch many great stories of him throughout scripture. But church, we as a church need to establish right now, establish it with me, that we will refuse to cave to a wicked culture. That we will refuse to, 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 to cave regardless of how loud people scream and how much they want us to bow at the altar of the world. We just won't do it. We need to be a people that know the voice of the Lord in these last days. We need to be a people that observes the word of God and holds it higher than any person or anything in the world, and we do what it says. Because I will tell you, there are plenty of pastors and leaders that are in their pulpits that are currently caving to the worship of the world because that's what their church wants. If you want to find that church, they exist everywhere. People that only want to tell you about how great you are, they will never speak to you about sin. They will never do what Moses is doing here and remind you that you were once a sinner, so give grace to someone else. They will never say things like that. But church, us as a church, the way that this church has been for, you know, decades now, we will not be one of those people. Do not get it twisted. God is angry at this sin. People who attempt to tie the word of God to sin, to lead others astray, oh yes, you can guarantee that the Lord is angry at that and I would not want to stand before the Lord telling people that I justified their sin by the word of God and taking it so far out of context that I told them that it was right. Leading people astray by the masses. This is where the anger of the Lord came at towards Aaron. Acts 5, 27 through 29, it says, when they brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them saying, did we not strictly command you to not teach in his name? And look, you fill Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. And Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Church, there's a time coming that we're gonna have to say that. We ought to obey God rather than man. Our heart needs to be one that desires to walk with the Lord and to preach the word of God despite what the rest of the world wants us to do. We ought to obey God rather than man. Now notice too, the part I had you underlined was uh, in uh, Deuteronomy 9, 18. And the reason I want you to underline it there is there's something that's revealed to us about Moses and what he did that was not in Exodus 32. It's not in that text. In fact, previously it wasn't revealed. He reveals it right now. In Exodus 32, it makes it sound like he came down from the hill and there was immediate action on Moses' part. It made it sound like he went down the hill, he, he grabbed their idol, he ground it into powder, and then he was like, drink it, you know, which, which he did do, but... This tells us there's something else happened before that. No, it says that right here, it says, and I fell down before the Lord as I did at first, 40 days and 40 nights, and I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin, which you committed doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. The first thing he did for his people that he was leading is he fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights before he did anything else. He didn't react crazy and break things and throw things and be mad. No, he went to the Lord and interceded for these people and their wickedness. And he brought them before the Lord. And then he broke up the idol and made them drink it. But 40 days and 40 nights, he spent there, you know, pressing into the Lord for them. I think it's important to recognize that Moses fasted and prayed even for a rebellious and difficult people. And it literally says that Moses prayed for the people and Aaron at the same time. So he spent this time just praying for people, talking about the people of Israel, talking about Aaron. Moses prayed and entreated to the Lord so the people would not be destroyed. Church, I can say that prayer changes things. If there is a difficult person in your life, 
that you don't understand why they're so difficult, why they're sinning the way they do, why they're continuing to go to the world, even though they know the right way and they're continuing to do that. I want to encourage you to not stop praying. For Moses, it was 40 days and 40 nights without food. Do not try that. I did not recommend this, but (laughs) pray and fast for that person. You're like, BJ told me not to eat or drink water for 40 days. I did not say that. (laughs) But I want us all to examine our hearts tonight. Think it would be wise to examine our life and ask this honest question in our hearts right now. With the brothers and sisters that are slipping in sin, maybe the sin disgusts you and maybe it has to do directly with you and so it disgusts you even more. Maybe there's a brother or sister that uh, is just difficult. They're just awful people, you know? Let me ask you your question. Is your first reaction just to get angry at them? To write them off because of the way they are living, because of the way they've treated you? Or do we, like Moses, press into the Lord on behalf of the people? Is there a desire in your heart for those people to see them come to know the Lord and to walk with him in a way that they should and to be completely restored? Or are you ready to see them judged by God? Church, I truthfully believe that sometimes as believers, we can be the ones sharpening the word of God, not as a sword, but more like a shiv. That we, can, that we can make ourselves feel better as we continue to just bash them over the head instead of loving them with the word of God. Instead of encouraging them in God's, God's mercy and God's love. Oftentimes, church, Christians can be people that are murdering their wounded instead of dragging them across the finish line with them. Church, we should never be the ones that look back and continue to run the race. If someone falls down, we should be wanting to see them restored and picking them on our shoulders and walking them together across that line. Don't give up on your family. Do not give up on your friends. And Moses is a great example of that, even for a stiff-necked people like Israel. It's a great picture of how we should intercede for others as well. So anyways, Moses is going to remind them a little bit more. We're, We're nearing the end of this message. He's going to remind him, you even started this journey on the wrong foot. Let me tell you some more about yourself, right? 22 through 24. Also at Tabera and at Masa and Kebroth Hatava, you provoked the Lord to wrath. Likewise, when the Lord um, sent you to Kadesh Barnea, saying, go up and possess the land which I have given you. Then you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and you did not believe him, nor you did not obey his voice. You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Moses gives him, you know, the three-piece and the soda here. Moses gives him the quick punch, humbling combo reminder, you know. Tabra, Numbers uh, numbers 11, 3. This is where you complained, and on the outskirts, the people were consumed by fire. Masa was Exodus 17, when the people complained about water, even to the point to where they're like, we are going to stone Moses if we don't get some water here soon. At Kibroth Hatava, Numbers 11, 34. Lusted after the flesh, complained at the Lord that they didn't have any food to eat. Then God sent so much quail that they ate until they were sick, and there was a great plague, and people died. You can picture Moses as one who knows these people, as that first pastor figure in the Bible. And he's like, and oh, and don't forget about this. And oh, don't forget about that. And oh, don't forget about this. Not because he wants to see them humiliated, not because he doesn't like them, not because he just is just being mean. No, the job of your pastor is not to tell you how great you are. If you're looking for that, this is not your church. The job of a pastor is not to tell you how great you are, rather it's to tell you how faithful our God is, despite how we can act sometimes. We want to appoint you to how great God is. And Moses is reminding them again, do not allow yourselves to become prideful when you're in that good land. It's a sobering moment, a sobering reminder, that much of like a parent or like a spouse will give you sometimes. Oh God, remind us about the truth of ourselves that we might not boast in anything but your great name in our lives. Without fail, the more prideful a person gets, the greater the problems exist in one's life. 
prideful man begins to view the sinner not as a person in need of a savior. Rather, they see them as something that they have never been or something that they have elevated their lives from. But the truth is this, Romans 3, 23, we have all fallen short the glory of God. Let us remember that truth about ourselves. Let us administer grace to those in need because of the grace that we've experienced in Christ Jesus, amen? 25 through 29 as we close and as the worship team comes back out. Thus I prostrated myself before the Lord. 40 days and 40 nights I kept prostrating myself. That's laying flat. Remember any time that they would mess up, he would lay flat before the Lord because the Lord had said he would destroy you. Therefore, I prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord God, do not destroy your people and your inheritance, whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. I love that. They're yours, God. They're definitely not mine. Don't forget that. They're your, they're your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Do not look on the stubbornness of this people or on their wickedness or their sin, lest the land from which you brought us should say, because the Lord was not able to bring them to the land which he promised them, and because he hated them, he has brought them out to kill them in this wilderness. Yet they're your people. They're your inheritance, whom you brought out by your mighty hand and by your outstretched arm. So often through the word of God, we can see things like in the book of Psalms, often how it starts is not how it ends. It's the same way here. He starts off by reminding and reminding them of how far they have fallen. And oh my goodness, and you did this and you did that. And it ends with, but these are your people, God. They belong to you with all their problems, with all their mistakes. They belong to you because of your favor. They're not my people. They're your people. I wanna give you this closing reminder that God doesn't work in our lives because of our righteousness, but rather by his grace, his love, his faithfulness, he works in our lives. Tonight, as you leave this room, let us humble ourselves before him tonight. Before we walk out of here, let's get some things right with the Lord that we may remember his goodness towards us. And when we remember his goodness towards us, let us move to be patient and loving with those people that are so difficult in our lives. Let us preach the truth of God's word to those who are difficult and trust in him and have faith that wherever we go, there will be victory when we are in him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I am thankful for your goodness towards us. And Lord, just like the story we read, Lord God, I have been difficult. I have been rebellious. But Lord, I'm yours. Lord, I thank you for paying the price for my sin, Lord, the cost of the cross, Lord. We just thank you so much that you sent Jesus, your only begotten son, God in flesh, to die on the cross for us for a penalty that we could not pay. Lord, we're thankful for the New Testament. And Lord, we're thankful that you love us enough to can just, just redeem us, Lord, to save us from hell. Lord, we wanna live by faith. Lord, we wanna walk in faith. Lord, we wanna trust you over our problems or our fears. And Lord God, we just want to be an example to those who do not know you. Lord, that we would look like your people. Lord, we would talk like your people. Lord, that every day you would conform us to your son's image, Lord. If there's anyone in this room that does not know you and they want to know you, if there's anyone in this room that wants to surrender their life to you tonight, that have not done it or they just need to return back to you, Lord, I just pray that right now they would just make a public declaration by that, by raising their hand right now. The Lord sees you. The Lord sees you. Is there anybody else? Amen. Lord, we're just so thankful for the hands that were raised. Lord, we're thankful that we're, regardless of what we've done or where we've been, Lord God, you desire a relationship with us and you've done it all, Lord. 
salvation, uh, you know, it's, it's, salvation is free, but it's not cheap, Lord. It costs you everything. And so, Lord, we just want to acknowledge that. We want to confess with our mouth. We want to believe in our heart that we can't save ourselves. It has to be you. You're our Savior, our Messiah. And so we're going to repeat this prayer. And those that raise their hand, repeat this prayer. And those of you that are believers in this room, let's walk them through this prayer together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord Jesus, I do believe that you are the Messiah, that you died on the cross, that you rose again for my sin. Lord, I want to live for you. I want to walk with you. I want to know you more every day of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Fill me full of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.